results, the Mets were swept in three games. But you know, thinking back on the old days of baseball, and you and I were raised in about the same time period, it was radio, there wasn't any television, and you had to kind of make your own pictures. What kind of pictures are conjured up in my mind? Mel Allen and Red Barber doing the Yankee games. The Yankees have virtually dominated World Series play. As a matter of fact, Barry, since 1921, the Yankees have played in the World Series almost every other year. They've won 107 games in, the, in World Series play. The Giants are second with only 39 victories. Listening to the games on radio, though, you know, really made our heroes, I think, bigger than life. Now with television, things are much more real, but we could really conjure up these great images. Things are blown way out of proportion now. They're overemphasized, and you've got to realize that almost 90 million, 100 million people are watching these games, and they are blown out of proportion. They're overemphasized in some respects and under in others. Well, we did make some big heroes in the old days, and one of the biggest heroes. What bigger? Babe Ruth of the New York Yankees, and wasn't he something special? And I think he would be in television these days as well. Few players have brought more great moments to baseball than the legendary Babe Ruth, and the World Series was an ideal showcase for his prodigious talents. Twice the Babe hit three home runs in a series game, but it's for one particular homer that he's best remembered. It came in the 1932 series with the Cubs, and here's the Babe's account of what happened. I remember again, it was a tough series. Both clubs riding each other, doing everything to get each other's goat. Well, I was this one particular time when I went to bat, Charlie Root was pitching. And the first pitch ball was a call strike. Well, I thought it was outside and didn't like it very much. So the boys that were there were give me this, on you, on you. Well, the second pitch ball was another call strike. Well, I didn't like that one either, so I let it go by. Well, I stepped out of the box, and by that time, they were over there going crazy. And I looked down at center field and I pointed. I said, I'm going to hit the next pitch ball right past the flagpole. Well, the good Lord must have been with me. There are those who were in Chicago that day who claim the babe really had been pointing at the pitcher and not at center field before he took his swing. Well, whether the babe called a shot or not, this homer did help win a game and led the Yankees to a series sweep. And it's the kind of story that rightfully belongs to Babe Ruth's chapter of baseball's Book of Legends. Another legendary series moment came courtesy of Willie Mays. His catch in 1954 is considered by many to be the greatest of all time. And it might well be. But let's not forget the heroics of another center fielder, Tommy Agee. In the fourth inning of the third game of the 69 series, Agee showed why the Mets really were amazing as he robbed Baltimore of what seemed like a certain scoring opportunity. Three innings later, the Mets were leading four to nothing, but the Orioles had the bases loaded. And that's when Tommy Agee came back for an encore. Agee was credited with preventing five runs from scoring in a game. The Mets won five to nothing. The next day, the unlikely figure of Ron Swoboda emerged as the new hero, as Tom Seaver protected a one to nothing lead. At the plate was Brooks Robinson, and Swoboda recalls what happened. He hit a line drive to my right. I thought I got a good jump on it because I wanted the ball to be hit to me. That's an important thing for an outfitter. I wanted the ball. What happened afterwards, I guess, was as big a surprise to me as it was to anyone in the stands. An incredible catch and an incredible year for the amazing New York Mets. But you know, sometimes there are World Series moments a guy might like to forget. Just ask the Phillies Bob Boone, who was mighty glad his buddy Pete Rose came to the rescue last year in Philadelphia. Well, it is a game of surprises, sometimes good, sometimes bad. In 1939, the Cincinnati Reds catcher Ernie Lombardi gained notoriety for what came to be known as the snooze at home. The man who started the play, Joe DiMaggio, tells the story. Art Fletcher, who was a third base coach, was trying to hold me up frantically, but I could see what was going on at home plate, and I just whizzed right by him, and just, because there was Lombardi laying right there, uh, right by the ball at home plate, but he was spread out, and he was seemed like to be knocked out. It was because Charlie Keller, in trying to uh, score, instead of sliding, he went in standing up, and he hit Lombardi in the side of the head accidentally. So I could see everything that was happening, but at the time as I was getting so close to the plate, he had wakened, and he grabbed the ball and put it right on top of home plate, and I was fortunate enough to put my foot right over the ball and tag the plate on the other side. Another hard luck catcher was Mickey Owen of the Dodgers. In 1941, a third strike got past him with two out in the ninth, 
and that opened the door to another Yankee Series victory. In 1972, catcher Johnny Bench became a victim of a different sort. With runners on second and third and a full count on Bench, the A's held a strategy session. It appeared that Bench would get a free trip to first as Gene Tennis called for an intentional. But the fake was on, and a startled Bench was truly caught looking. Now when it comes to pitching, everybody knows about Don Larson's perfect game. But how about Bob Gibson's performance for the St. Louis Cardinals in the opener of the 68 series? Gibson's regular season had been one of the best on record, and he remained true to form as he blazed his fastball past one Tiger batter after another, striking out seven in the first three innings alone. The Tigers had their hands full all day as catcher Tim McCarver called all the right pitches, and Gibson kept the heat turned on. In the ninth, Gibson picked up his 15th strikeout, tying the World Series record of Sandy Koufax. But Gibson didn't stop there, as the next batter, Norm Cash, fanned the new record of 16 was his and his alone. Finally, with two outs in the ninth, Gibson puts the icing on the cake. 17 strikeouts, all capping off a five-hit shutout masterpiece. The greatest hitting performance of recent times has to be the spectacular grand finale to the 1977 World Series when a Yankee newcomer answered the call. Reggie Jackson had shared in past championships with Oakland, but on this night, the controversial slugger went a step further as he began an awesome power display in the fourth inning with a home run that put the Yankees ahead to stay in game six. In the bottom of the fifth, Reggie kept right on rolling as he delivered yet another home run, and the Yankees held a 7-3 lead over a Dodger team on the verge of elimination. With reliever Charlie Huff on the mound in the eighth inning, something big is about to happen as Reggie sets his sights on a record. And with his third swing of the evening, Jackson launches his third home run. Only Babe Ruth had ever hit as many in a series game. For Reggie, it was his finest moment. But later, he modestly avoided comparison with some of the game's greats. I think the word that superstar is overused a lot. Guys like the Maggio and Mays and, and Aaron and Clemente and I can now say that I had one day that was like those guys. All humility aside, Reggie had made history with three homers in the game and a record five in the series. Well, you know, it really wasn't so much the fact that Reggie Jackson hit three home runs in a World Series game. That's good enough in and of itself. But the fact that he made a legend of himself in a legendary place, Yankee Stadium, makes it that much more special. Now, Barry, there's so much tradition and lore there. But if you think there's tradition and lore there now, you should have been there before they renovated the place. In 1964, I played in the World Series with the Cardinals uh, against the Yankees. And as a 21-year-old walking into Yankee Stadium, the reverence with which you hold... Uh, the place is, is unbelievable. It's like walking into a cathedral. Let me ask you about the 1968 World Series, which you also played in with the Cardinals. We use the term killer instinct a great deal in a lot of sports in describing athletes, but you don't hear it too much in baseball. And yet, the performance of Bob Gibson in the first game in the 1968 World Series, and you, of course, were the catcher, probably indicates that if there is ever a killer instinct in this game, it was there on that day. Well, of course, Bob Gibson holds a strikeout record. He struck out 17 Detroit Tigers that day. And I, I never will forget uh, Willie Horton being the last hitter uh, of the game. He took a slider on the inside part of the plate, and it broke so much that to this day I know Willie Horton thinks the ball hit him. <laughs> I would have to think that the 1981 World Series